All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Nick Collins, who is in Wisconsin. How are you doing, Nick? I'm doing great. Just trying to stay warm today. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that problem. So uh, just thought I'd rub that in because I'm originally from Ireland. So I just love rubbing it in now that I have hot weather that other people don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Nick is the founder and CEO of Satoris Digital, uh, founded in 2013, help companies identify and execute uh, high value web and mobile software initiatives. And what we want to talk about is uh, starting from scratch, so you had to pivot twice in your life um, with your career and then take a different approach to digital marketing. So let's talk about the the, the pivots first. Um, what, what prompted those? Well, the first big one was uh, it came when I started my business back in 2013. Um, some of your audience may be aware of a technology called Flash. It was like the mm -hmm. main technology for any kind of multimedia on the web for a very long time. And I had spent close to 16 years of my career specializing in that particular technology stack. Uh, and then, you know, there was a, the famous letter from Steve Jobs that said, hey, this will never be allowed on my iPhones or iPads. And we, we saw a massive shift in the industry where people like myself went from being in extremely high demand to essentially being pariahs in the industry, right. probably being able to find work anywhere. Uh, and that happened virtually overnight, I think over the course of about two months. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that was a, a big shift for me because like I said, I'd spent you know, a good portion of my career specializing in that. And so I had to figure out, okay, well, if I'm not gonna do this, then what's next? Do I go like strict mobile and learn, you know, how to do iPhone apps or Android apps or, you know, wh what's next? And so I, I really kind of had to sit down and look at it and go, okay, what, where do I think the industry is going? And fortunately, I, I, I made a good choice in saying, you know what, forget technology. I'm, I'm going to be agnostic to the technology. I'm going to embrace everything and focus on the, the, the core principles of, okay, what is good software development and what, what is good uh, user experience? And then I'll use whatever technology is the best fit for the client's needs. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great story, uh, you know, the Flash one. And obviously Adobe did that with Adobe Air too. They, um, they sunsetted that, yeah. uh, that piece of technology. Um, which actually once upon a time we used to use because it was actually very, very good technology. But unfortunately, they decided oh, yeah, to- a wonderful to platform, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so, so you moved into uh, being agnostic about, about technology and, and coming at it from the, the best user experience, the best outcome for, for your clients. What, when you pivoted from being technology-based to being experience-based, what was that change like? Say it was a learning curve would be an understatement. <laughs> um, I, you, you, user experience was always part of the equation, but it was always kind of, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but it was something that we said, okay, this is the technology stack we're using. And then we figured out the user experience based on the technology choice, right? I, I kind of flipped that around and said, okay, what is the experience we need? And now let's look at, okay, what technology do we need to achieve that experience? Um, so it, it really required a, a different way of thinking about things that it, it took a little bit of adjustment. But overall, I think it's it's made for a much better, um, we're, we're able to service our customers much better by approaching it that way versus, you know, a, a lot of companies have their, their favorite technology stacks. You know, you might go to mm -hmm. this place, it's, this is a .NET shop or this is a Java shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so... To me, that's kind of like the backwards way of approaching things, right? And part of the reason why I, I started the business to begin with is I really saw that a lot of companies would get sold on a particular technology, and then they'd go to their IT department or you know whoever was um, 
you know, whoever was in charge of that aspect of their business, be like, hey, we just bought this new software, this new technology. Now figure out how we can use it, right? And mm -hmm. I, I saw that a whole bunch of times, you know, both internally as a, as like an employee and externally as a consultant. And I just kind of shake my head and go, this just seems completely wrong. This is this is completely backwards. And I think I can do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I, I, I like I like uh, the I like what you just outlined there, because I do think that is that is unfortunately how a lot of uh, companies operated, especially with their IT departments kind of just dictated the technology mm -hmm. and you worked around the constraints of the technology as opposed to figuring out what it is you really wanted to deliver and then deciding on the technology. Um, however, I would say nowadays, uh, Nick, I think you'd agree, it certainly is a lot easier to swap around technologies and use different ones and different platforms than it used to be. So whether that is a good, whether that's has given more flexibility um, or whether it has just made things a little more confused, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, it's definitely made things simpler in the way like, you know, now you got tools like Zapier and things like that, mm. that, you know, they can get kind of the glue between a lot of different tools. Um, so it does give you the flexibility, but I think it's also led to a lot of, you know, the shiny object syndrome, right? Yeah. Where mm -hmm. people are constantly looking for something just a little better and they never, they never settle on anything. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'll try this CRM and you know, man, now this one looks really cool. So let's try that one. Oh, now this one looks really cool. Let's try that one. And they keep bouncing around rather than say, okay, what is it we need to achieve? And now let's look at the landscape and see which tool is going to meet our needs the best. So the, the, the principle of, you know, the way we approach things hasn't really changed as a result of that. It's just a lot easier to implement. Yeah. And, and I think one of the other challenges, too, is like at least, I guess, um, back in the day, uh, you had the, you know, there was the IT department and the CIO or whoever it was who mm -hmm. You know, so you had a kind of centralized body for making technology decisions. I mean, obviously now with with SaaS products um, and with some of them being with web technologies and them being some of them being very simple, is that non technical? So now the decision making has become, if you like, it's become distributed across the organization. So now often people will make a decision on technology, never talk to the IT department. Hmm. Yeah, and that, that can have its you know, pluses and minuses. Um, it's great for us being the technologists because we are the experts who can then give them guidance. It's okay. Here's what we think based on our experience will be the best, best tool or best technology for what you're trying to achieve. And you don't have to fight against, uh, the IT departments that are entrenched in their preferences as much. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're also dealing with non-technical people and so you really have to make sure that you can communicate effectively what the differences are and what the benefits are of choosing your recommendation over something else that just looks cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you work when you work with clients, how do you help them over the shiny object syndrome or the this looks really cool? We really want to do this, um, and and kind of back them up a little bit to okay, let's not talk about how we're going to do this, but let's talk about what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do is every new project starts off with what we call the initial fitting. Um, you may or may not know this, but the word Sartorius in our name is actually derived from the Latin word for tailored because everything we do is yeah. custom tailored to that specific client's need. So we kind of follow that metaphor through our process and we call that initial um, well, call it discovery, but we call it the initial fitting. So we take the measurements of their needs. We get it really dig in, make them kind of force them to think about all the processes, all of the um, the secondary and tertiary requirements that are go they're going to be affected. So they can say, okay, well, hey, we want to do this over here. Say, okay, but how is that going to affect this other process? Because there's a lot of times a lot of dotted lines between these processes that mm -hmm. you need to be aware of. People don't always think about ahead of time. So we take them through this process where we force them to think through all those things and really define in very clear black and white what they need to accomplish. And I think just, you know, 
kind of force them to think through those things helps them to be able to be more intentional in their choices. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent point, an excellent approach. Uh, I, I think it's 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 difficult sometimes now because we live in such a shortcut culture. Everybody's in a rush. Everybody wants things immediately. So, actually, digging, mm -hmm. doing the proper preparation work in advance is almost like counterculture to some people nowadays. But it's it's so, it's so so important. Um, so. Um, when you when you work with when you work with with your clients then um the the technology decision obviously is based on what their outcome what they want to achieve but i guess it's also balanced with what will work for them personally mm -hmm. oh absolutely you know at the end of the day it has to be something that, that works for them like you said you know it has to be easy to use it has to be somewhat intuitive you can have the most powerful platform in the world, but if they can't actually sit down and figure out how to use it, it it's not worth anything, right? It's kind of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, putting a 16 year old behind the wheel of a NASCAR, you know, uh, vehicle. If they can figure out how to start it, then that'll be a, you know, an achievement <laughs> for them. Um, it's not like, you know, you get into your normal sedan, you push the button and mm -hmm. it starts up, right? So, you know, it, it's important to, to know your client and to know you know who who your target audience is and what their expectations are and that's where a lot of the the software development that we do comes in because there may be a platform that really fits their needs but it doesn't have the greatest user interface and so we might build a user interface that leverages their apis so we take their powerful platform and make it simple make it accessible to the client yeah, and I guess that's uh, that's where the. I mean, you mentioned things like Zapier earlier, um, but also you just touched mm -hmm. on APIs. Like, like for instance, we have two open APIs for for our CRM for Pipeliner. Uh, I think that's the the critical piece now is the ability to be able to easily bring in other systems, or like you said, in your case, is build a layer, maybe a presentation layer on top of, of another technology. Uh, have you found now that it's getting easier and easier to integrate? And do you see that, uh, I mean, do you see that's the future, like integration is going to become simpler and simpler and simpler? Uh, that, that's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. Because while, while the, the setup may become simpler, it also introduces another layer where problems can happen, where there could be failures. And especially when we're talking about software as a service products, then you don't necessarily have control over those. Yeah. Um, and and that, that, that at times makes me a little nervous because, okay, I, I, I'm a big proponent of Zapier, but I've also had plenty of times where my zaps just started failing out of the blue for no apparent reason. And all of a sudden, things that are supposed to be connecting aren't, and data's not coming through. And I may not find out until two days later when I get the email saying, hey, some of your apps have failed. And now there's you know, a backlog of like 300 records that I have to try and mm -hmm. reprocess. And hopefully it doesn't break the, you know, the chain because it was expecting things at a certain time before other things happened. And, you know, so it, it really requires you to... to again use them intentionally think through what your workflows are going to be and try and have as many, a few pieces that can break as possible and when you do have something that could break having a way of being able to quickly diagnose it and repair it uh is paramount yeah because one of the challenges is uh obviously the more things you do like that the more like integrations or zaps that you use or you build uh you know custom integrations and you use the apis is is exactly what you said is you now have multiple points of failure that you have to be very aware of and we often see this with you know when people update you know softwares or whatever suddenly they break all mm -hmm. the connections because nobody thought about that so while while yeah API I agree, changes while it does, and all of a sudden everything breaks yeah 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 so while i agree with you i mean it 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 will become simpler it also introduces the complexity and the those points of failure absolutely yeah. Um, so, um, so where do you see the where do you see the future? I mean, particularly as you're in, you know, in 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 software development and and digital development, where do where do you see 
things going now from the point of view of, of people like yourself? I mean, um, what do you see the future for development? Well, user experience is always becoming more and more prevalent. So it used mm -hmm. to be you'd have like a, a graphic designer who would design some really pretty user interface that was a work of art, but made no intelligible sense as far as actually be able to interact with the thing, you know, it's where mm -hmm. you get to see things like the circular menus and, you know, things like that, you know, of, uh, you know, that we saw like the, you know, the nineties and early two thousands, um, or, or menus that floated and moved around and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, people have, you know, as the industry has matured, people have really started to see, hey, well, we really need to focus on the actual experience, how people interact with the technology, and what can we do to make that better? And that's really become a, a, a core discipline in and of itself, is understanding how people interact with the technology and try to make it as simple as possible. And Apple has, for a long time, really excelled at that. Um, they, they've been a kind of a thought leader in that space, where... They really focused on how people interact with their, the things that they build, and other people are really starting to kind of follow their their um, the, the the path that they've set in, in, in that regard. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, so you know, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see the the interaction layer become simpler and simpler, easier and easier to use. I mean, when you got to the point now where you can have a you know a four year old pick up an iPad. And instinctively know how to use it, you know. Th th I think that's a good thing as far as you know the simplicity of you know the human interaction with technology. While at the same time, in order to have the surface be simple, everything under the hood gets a lot more complex, um, a lot more intelligent. You're seeing a lot more AI and things like that that are um, that are becoming very very popular. Even in tools mm -hmm. like Photoshop, you know, now they're having all this yeah. AI built in where you can have Photoshop remove things from the background just by you like clicking on it, right? Yeah. Um, th th things that, you know, I remember, you know, 15, 20 years ago trying to do that. You know, you might spend two or three days trying to remove something and have it look natural. And now yeah, the AI yeah, can yeah. do it in 30 seconds. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you, and I agree with you on the on the on the usability. Yeah, I had my uh, my friend's uh, two year old grab my phone the other day and just started swiping on it, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like completely nat completely natural to her. Just took the phone, was like, oh, do, 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 do. and I'm like, wow, I barely know how to do that. Um, and so I mean, I agree with that. Uh, you know, part of the things that it has to be the the user, it has to be the user experience. And we're becoming, as I said to you earlier, is we're becoming so used to everything being easy, everything. And I guess mm -hmm. people like Apple have have spoiled us, have spoiled us. But they've set the bar for everyone else because if you don't have a similar um, number one, if it's not aesthetically pleasing and simple to use, you're you're already kind of grating a little bit with your audience absolutely yeah yeah and we, we've seen that you know in the in the android space because it's not as co tightly controlled as apple mm -hmm. like app store um and so you'll see a lot of you know really great apps on there and a lot of really subpar ones and you know the, the differences become very stark right yeah um the you know the the, the rock stars really stand out and the other ones just like you know it's almost painful to use them and they, you know, people don't tend to use them very long. So, you know, I think what you'll see is, you know, there, there'll always be the subpar stuff flowing out there, but uh, I think, you know, you'll see more and more of the professional tools, more and more people who are, you know, Hey, this is their work. This is their livelihood. They're, they're going to mm -hmm. focus on the user experience and on that accessibility. Um, and, and another big thing that's really coming to the forefront on that is not just, you know, ease of use and accessibility in terms of, you know, hey, just be able to pick up and use it, but also in terms of like the ADA compliance and helping people right. who, you know, are, um, you know, impaired in some way to be able to have a, as close to that same experience as possible, whether, you know, it's, you know, providing things to help them, you know, with, you know, visual cues or, um, or tactile interactions to be able to help them interact with it. Those things are really becoming, um, you know, much much more mature and much more uh, being brought to the forefront. So I think, I think that's a really good thing that you know 
people are being cognizant of that now rather than just going, oh, well, you know, 90% of my users don't need that, so I'm not going to worry about it. You know, now they're saying, well, you know what? I don't care if it's only a, a small percentage of my users. I'm going to make sure that they're taken care of too. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's great. I think that's such a such a great uh, a great um, step forward. And and it becomes obviously the technology is making it more and more viable to do that. Listen, thank you, Nick. All of Nick's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So, like I said, my name is Nick Collins. I am the owner and CEO of Sartorius Digital. Uh, we are a full service digital agency doing web design, digital marketing, app development, you know, the whole nine. Uh, so if, if you need any help with, you know, bringing your business out of your know, brick and mortar to digital or just helping to increase your presence online, we can help you with that. Fantastic. And I would encourage you to go check it out uh, as, as Nick uh, outlined. You know, a lot of these things are look like they're becoming simpler, but they're actually becoming more complex than what you need to actually take into consideration. And user experience is paramount today. It's no longer a bumper sticker. It's a reality. So you better you better get, make sure your user experience is optimized. So thanks again, Nick. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you.